Welcome to Hotline 21. I'm your host here at the Gift House, and we have a great show for you today. As you know, this is the t our election time, uh, our election time in the city of Chicago, and we have two great guests for you. Um, to my right, we have Paul Vallis, and we have David Herrera. And Paul, my understanding, you are running for mayor. That's last time I checked. I'm still running for mayor. Okay. And uh, Herrera, you are running for alderman of the 26th Ward? 26th Ward, generally the Humble Park neighborhood. Okay. Well, listen, without further ado, let's get right down to the nitty gritty of it. We've got some big issues. We've got um, several, several candidates running for mayor. And uh, because we've got some major issues. And I'd like to start uh, with one of the biggest ones, the uh, Laquan McDonald issue. Uh, and I think that kind of set the, the wheels running or, or turning, should I say, for the uh, mayor's uh, office. Uh, Paul, since you are the candidate for mayor, what would you do to bridge the gap between the Chicago police and citizens? Well, I think what you have to do is you have to begin to restore the police department because what happened uh, during the uh, Emmanuel McCarthy era, so to speak, was they really degraded the police department. They didn't fill close to, uh, well, well over 1,500 vacancies. They depleted the detectives division. Uh, because they uh, eliminated many of the support units, uh, what they did was they uh, they created a dynamic where police officers were just being sent all over the city, depending on whatever the hot spot or the need is. Mm -hmm. So you lost this concept of beat integrity. Beat integrity is where you have a fixed number of officers working specific districts and specific communities. And when you lose beat integrity, that means you have officers working communities where they are not known and communities that they are not familiar with, and that creates mm -hmm. a dangerous situation. The second thing that they did was they depleted the supervisory ranks. They went from one sergeant per 10 officers to one to 30. And, I mean, the military has a squad leader for every 11 squad members. Uh, it's so by doing that, they lost kind of that command and control, which is critical in a police department. And so they, they, they allowed the supervisory infrastructure to, to really collapse. And then the third thing that they did was they, by depleting the uh, detectives division, and, and let me point out that at the time when the Chicago Police Detectives Division went from 1,200 to less than 800, New York had 4,500 detectives. Mm -hmm. But by doing that, they, they began to lose the battle in terms of getting, uh, uh, you know, uh, shooters and killers off the street. I mean, their clearance rate on crime, on, on murders, was 17%. So, you know, so you had instances in the community where the community was reluctant to interact with the police, not that they didn't trust them, but the police didn't have the resources to respond to them in a timely mm -hmm. manner. No witness protection I, program. I'm going to pause you yes. for one second. Yes. We've got a caller. Okay. Caller, uh, state your question or co comment. Hi. Uh, I would just like to know um, why for Paul is there. I'm sorry. What's your last name again? Vallis. Vallis. I apologize. Yes. Um, why would you be running for the city of Chicago as mayor? And what can you bring to the city that would bring the city together? As we all know, that Chicago is one of the most segregated cities in right. the nation. Okay, so let me respond. That's a very good question. First of all, let me respond what I, I want to do with the police department. I want to fill the vacancies and restore beat integrity so police officers are dedicated to communities and they are in the communities. They're not moved around. So because the foundation of good community policing is beat integrity. Secondly, uh, when I ran the Chicago Public Schools, I opened a series of military high schools mm -hmm. and uh, an ROTC programs. There are 10,000 students in ROTC programs. 90% are black and Latino. Well, the next generation of cops, firefighters, uh, EM, EMS, nurses, etc., a drone pilot, as drone operators, can be students from the very community. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, if if the police department begins to reflect the community in the coming years, that's going to have a transformational effect. Now, the caller mentions something about uh, racism, racism. Uh, uh, in, in, in the city. How would you address that? Well, you know, the same, uh, I would take the same approach that I took when I ran the Chicago Public Schools. Now, you have to understand, I built 78 schools 
and renovated over 350 schools when I ran the Chicago Public Schools. They had 70,000 more students than they have today. And let me point out that 70% of my administrators, principals, assistant principals, senior administrators, junior administrators were, were minority. In fact, they were black and Latino. So at the end of the day, I empowered the community by giving the community power. The second thing that I did was 80% of my construction was in the poorest communities. Mm -hmm. New schools, new uh, the prefab schools on the west side, torn down, replaced by brick and mortar schools. The third thing I did was I allocated contracts with with historic minority and women-owned business and minority hiring set-asides. 54% of our $3.2 billion in construction went to minority companies whom I insured, and 58% of those hired, $1.8 billion I'm gonna, I'm gonna went to minority one, workers. I'm going to pause one moment. Yeah. Now, David, I want to pull you in this conversation. Okay, uh, the question, same question I asked Paul, how would you bridge the gap between Chicago police and citizens? <clears throat> and how, and, and since as alderman, how would you work with the president, or how you work with the mayor to bridge that gap? Yeah, so uh, we see the side effects of the con consolidation that happened in our district. Uh, where I where I live, there's beats uh, 12 and 14, mm -hmm. uh, districts 12 and 14, and um, you know they're their office was sh uh, shut down from August, Augusta and Walcott, and now they're they're across town. They're on 18th and State Street over by Cermak. So if they, if they have to make an arrest, they have to drive way across town, way on the other side of the Eisenhower, which essentially divides the north and the south side of Chicago with the, with the barrier being the expressway. And so you've got uh, an uptick in crime because it just takes them longer to kind of take them to the station and get back into the neighborhood. Um, so we need to have good relationships with uh, CAPS. My campaign manager is a CAPS beat facilitator. I myself attend both 12 and 14 district CAPS meetings frequently. So we will be engaged. Our goal is to attend um, those meetings at least one, or if not, my staff will be there. Um, additionally, um, Paul did mention this, we do have a lot of attrition happening right now. So it's been challenging the last few years where we've had, an, um, we've had a lot of police retiring that have been there the last 20, 25, 30 years, and there's been a shortage of, of police to actually backfill those jobs. So the city, the, the police department, as far as I know, has been an aggressive campaign to hire new staff over the last two and a half years. And um, as far as you know, I know, the, the, the district that I'm in has, has, is still, there's still like a 50, 50 officer shortfall. Okay, let, let me, we're going to come back to that question. Let me post this question to, and first it's going to be to Paul. Okay. Uh, what can you do about the drive-by shootings that's happening in the city? We're going to hold that question. we got a caller coming in. Okay. Go ahead, caller, say your question or comment. Oh, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned about the shootings because my question is, to both candidates, how can we resolve these issues on the expressway shootings, and will you have come up with some solution, maybe camera, and if so, how would you get that resources to uh, get the cameras on the expressway if it's possible? Okay, Paul, you want to take that? Yeah, you know, I will, I, but, but hopefully before we're done, I mm -hmm. can return to the question that the previous caller asked about how you're going to change the dynamic that makes the city so segregated, because I okay. do want to answer that question. Let me just say this, you know, if you have enough police officers, first of all, when it comes to the interstate and state highways and things like that, those highways, obviously, the state has a responsibility to police those highways, too. So now with the, with the new governor in and perhaps being more receptive to the needs of Chicago, closer coordination between all the law enforcement agencies from the county to the state as well as to the city can help improve uh, uh, security. Caller, state your question Sorry. or comment. Uh, I'm directing this call to David Herrera, uh, 26 Ward. Uh, my question is everybody is in an uproar about affordable housing, but what's going to happen to the low-income housing residents of the 26 Ward if he takes office? So, yeah, the current housing will stay. It's been in place for multiple years. At Humboldt Park does have a higher concentration of affordable housing uh, um, when you consider across other communities. Um, my policy is going to be a mixed policy approach, so we will add market and affordable, market rate and affordable. That's, I think we need a balanced approach. Um, I was at a debate last night, and the alderman, the current incumbent had mentioned he was going to build 100% CHA uh, project 
based and we know that model did not work so my thing is that you know I'm not for one extreme where it's laissez-faire 100 percent market rate I'm not also for the other extreme where it's 100 okay. percent affordable we need a we need a diverse yeah. neighborhood and a di um, and that's Atlanta. we have strength and diversity yeah, let me just say let me just say one thing uh, what I will do as mayor is I will cap property taxes I've laid out a financial plan that in effect would cap property taxes so no one that even if their valuation increases by 20 30 percent they'll never see an increase in property taxes more than one or two percent a year that will protect against gentr gentrification and the second thing that I'll do is I will basically remove the obstacles to the conversion of unimproved property into garden units. If you did that in your ward alone, in your ward alone, you could create 2,000 additional affordable units without a single dime in taxpayer subsidy. So capping property taxes and removing the obstacles to the uh, uh, you know providing of more affordable housing by so there's a shadow supply with okay. garden we units. We got another caller. Exactly. We got another call on the line. Uh, yes, and hey, good, after, good afternoon, guys, and uh, to yes. both of y'all candidates, good luck to both of y'all. Thank you. Um, listen, two things. You know, sometimes it, it's always better to take the cotton out of the ear than put it in the mouth. We <laughs> have to listen sometimes. You, by listening, we're going to figure out things. Uh, you, let's go to the police officers that uh, Mr. Violas said you were speaking about. Mm -hmm. We wanted, people wanted more officers in the street. But give me more officers in the street. I even heard you say that one time. Let's uh -huh. put more officers in the street. Well, listen, we did that. But now they shutting down because that's a lot of money that has to be paid to the police department. Now they're not opening up the classes, the applications to become uh, detectives, mm -hmm. and now that's going to be more money. So, again, we can't have everything that we want, but there's some things that we could work together right. if people just listen together and quit. We, we just can't know everything, but we need to take suggestions. We need to listen, and it will be a simple thing to do to try. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. No, I'm not at all. giving you my point. Good and point. I want to thank you so much for taking this call. Thank you, caller. Let me get out the air so I can hear your response. Thank, thank, you. Thank, thank you, caller. Do you want me to re respond to him really quick? Sure, quick. Yeah, yeah, respond. Yeah, you know, very quickly, first of all, if you if you fill the vacancies, you won't be spending hundred to $170 million in overtime a year. What's happening is because there's a shortage of police officers and they're moving them all over the city, they're paying an enormous money. They're paying close to $100 million more in overtime than they paid when I was city budget director and we had a record Number of police. So it's not a case of more resources, it's a case of the effective use of resources. But police have got to be familiar with the communities that they're serving, and they've got there's got to, got to be a pipeline that makes it easier for people from the community to become police officers and firefighters. David, you want a quick response to that, or you want to take the next caller? Let's take the next caller. Okay, next caller. Uh, yes, hi. This call is directed to David Herrera. Uh, what are you going to do anything better than Alderman Maldonado has already done with the police forces of his commander meetings, and how are you going to make it better? Because from what I understand, our crime rate has gone down by 45% in Humble Park alone. So how are you going to make things any better? Yeah, so, yeah, so um, the, you know, the Alderman, yeah, he just did a photo shoot with some of the commanders. He had a meeting, and, the, and that's very nice. Um, but you know, Google, Google it. He had a big. Uh, he was baiting the police uh, a year a year ago in 2017, in the summer, try, trying to drive through a crime scene. Um, and the cops are, you know, he, he has, doesn't get along with them. He's got a reputation for that. So, um, and I go to, I to the, the caps meetings frequently. I differ. And I a lot to differ of a, I a lot of the, the caps meetings. I'm sorry, caller. What was your question? She said she begged to differ, I think that's what she said. Okay. Well, you can Google him and uh, pull up the video, and you'll see it's a seven-and-a-half-minute video, Roberto Maldonado. Just Google it, and you can just see for yourself. Okay. That, well, let's get back Let's get back to task okay. here. Uh, how would you, and this question is for Paul, how would you repair the pension deficit for police, and where would we get the money from? It? Okay, so let me respond. I've actually laid out, if you go to... ValisForAllChicago.com, and if you look up City Club, Vallis 
budget presentation. It's online. Um, I, I actually gave a speech on how to balance the budget, finance pensions, and cap property taxes. And basically what I would do for pensions is the following mm -hmm. things. You know, first of all, I would have a fair, an agenda for the new governor and mm -hmm. for the state legislature, which of course is controlled by Chicago Democrats, veto-proof uh, control. Uh, so that w uh, we would ensure that our share of state income tax revenues mm -hmm. and corporate personal property replacement tax revenues is maintained because what happened under the previous administration is they capped increases in, uh, in local government distributed fund revenues which is our share of the state income tax which is supposed to go to local governments and uh, they diverted about three hundred million dollars in uh, corporate personal property replacement tax revenues, which are supposed to go to local governments. We lost about $100 million. So uh, I would protect the revenues that we're entitled to. That's the first thing. The second thing that I would do is, you know, I'm a person who has managed 17 multi-billion dollar budgets in four crisis situations in four different states, including rebuilding the entire school system in New Orleans after Katrina. So I know how to find savings in the budget. So I've laid out a series of recommendations where I believe that over the next four years we can reduce our base spending not the normal increases but the kind of the base expenditures by about five or six percent if we're able to protect our revenues at the state level and reduce our base expenditures by five or six percent at the local level and when i balanced the chicago public school budgets back in the 90s and i built our huge surpluses i was actually able to adjust our base expenditures by nine percent if we're able to do that we will have funded our pension obligations you have to understand these big increases in pension funding is not a sudden increase it's an increase over the next four years so we have four years to fully implement our state agenda and we have four years not one year like I had in Chicago Public Schools mm -hmm. but four years to implement our expenditure reduction plans and if we do that we're going to be able to address the pension issue and then we'll be able to cap local property tax increases okay. thank you okay Paul. David same question. How would you work with the mayor me. in terms of? <laughs> well, for, for me, I'm, I'm a financier by trade, and um, Paul's got a lot of great ideas. I also have a, a, you know, we both are ideas people, and that's what we need. We need outside box of thinking. Solutions for pension funds, you, we, we have a fiscal mess in our hands, and we need to grow our way out of it economically. The stag, lead, the stag lags job growth, the city lags most major cities in job growth. And so we need to look at our backyard and start creating economic empowerment zones mm -hmm. so we can get some of these factories that have been abandoned for years back up and running. We keep people in the city. They're leaving the city and they're leaving the state. So that's we got to plug that hole because we're losing out on um, revenue, uh, payroll revenue, et cetera, uh, payroll tax revenue, uh, property revenue. Um, as far as the pension thing, I got to cut you off because okay. we, we got a lot of right. questions. Okay, we get so out. I got to ask you this question here. I'm going to start with Paul again. But good point about growth. You're absolutely right. The city has to grow if we're going to grow our tax base. Conceal carry was his police. Your views on that, Paul? Well, look. The bottom line is we can't block. Uh, you know, we can't legislate the type of gun protections we need without the state and the federal government doing so because our our bo our borders are going to be porous. What we've got to do on 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 gun crimes is first of all, look. Uh, you know, I have I've been one of the strongest advocates for. Uh, decriminalization of, of certain drug offenses and as alternatives to uh, sentencing for nonviolent offenders. And I worked uh, for a year with, in the Justice Department on, on alternative programs and on programs to train uh, uh, individuals in the uh, correction in the federal prisons uh, for uh, for occupation so that they could get jobs when they got out so you know so I've been very strong in these issues but there is no substitution for charging people who violate gun laws serious charges and I'm talking about serious violations and, and, and that includes uh, charging people who commit crimes with guns or are on a crime scene with a gun and we've got to get serious about sentencing because the biggest deterrent against gun use particularly because who would have thought 20 years ago that we would have carry concealed it not in our wildest dreams and okay. we ever think we'd okay. have carry I'm gonna concealed. pause you right there okay David same question concealed carry to assist police your views so uh, you know, we do have the concealed carry law I mean it's a federal it, it, it's it's unconstitutional to to take it away, I think what we do have, uh, we have a problem where there's a revolving door going on. Criminal justice system, you've got, you see some of these people, and it's repeat, repeat crime mm -hmm. after crime, and so we either either need to provide services for them, you know, they could have mental illnesses, or you know, to 
to um, re re um, rehabilitate them. So. Okay, we're going to move on. Okay. Uh, at, uh, I know crime was really big in the city, but we're going to move on to health care. And um, health care is something we hold dear here at, uh, at Gift House. Uh, mental illness in the city, how would you deal with the problems as mayor? Oh. All right. What I propose is not only to reopen the six closed mental health centers, but we have one time we had actually had 19 mental health centers. Then they reduced to 12 under daily, and then Emmanuel closed six of them. I want a, to open a community run, community operated mental health and wellness centers in each of the police districts. And look, uh, we can fund them. We can reprogram our resources and we can provide the revenues to open these centers. Also, if we help those centers build for what they're entitled to at both the federal and state level, they can get a, a much greater return. But, you know, because a, a, they, a lot of their services can be built. A lot of their services can be built to both the federal government as well as to the state. Uh, but, but what I would also do is they're they're going to legalize cannabis in other words they're going to tax they're going to legalize cannabis and they're going to tax it i want to make sure that the city gets its fair share of the new cannabis revenue and i want to use all that money i want to use the cannabis revenue to invest in community-based social services like mental health and wellness centers like opioid and drug addiction mm -hmm. treatment centers like legal aid services like uh, family counseling and family assistance services like community-based health, physical, general health services. Thank you. Okay. David, similar question. Mental illness in the city, particularly in your ward, how would uh, you uh, address those problems? Yeah, mental illness, is uh, it's huge. We do need to fund it. I do agree with Paul. We need to fund it through um, the recreational use of marijuana or other a new t uh, revenue source. Um, the one thing to note, we just had this polar vortex a, a week ago, 90% of the homeless are, are have mental illness. And I found out, I was doing some research, we actually opened up our office as a warming center and we, we did bring in a 26-year-old who we're looking to, uh, we found him shelter and we're looking to get him job placement. But I found out there's just only one intensive care center in the entire city for that. Now, um, and that's over at Mount Sinai in California and in Ogden. So we need to have more of those around the city. And, um, you know, we're, we're lagging there. So I think another solution, since, since we have dropped the ball there, the city has, um, we need to create a committee to oversee that, to um, lead the charge in Thank uh, providing you. these services. Uh, Paul, homeless, homeless individuals who need health care. Mm -hmm. How would you address that? Well, first of all, you know, I think the city has an obligation to provide health care and, and working uh, not only in isolation, but also with the county and other health care providers. There's no reason why we can't fill the gap. Uh, obviously, we need to work with people to make sure that they are signed up for health care and they have access to health care that may be available to them. Uh, both at the federal and state and uh, level, but we have got to be prepared to fill the gaps. So when I talk about reestablishing community-based social services, that includes those service, social services, also includes community-based health care clinics and things like that. And we can do that in partnership with, with these small neighborhood high schools where they can have a network of, of service providers in the community so we can provide those services to those who might, don't, sometimes just to drop in services for those who might not have access to health care. We can give them easy access and we can basically provide them with Thank subsidized health care. David, similar question How yeah, would you, about, I, from the ward level. So yeah, I'd like to provide housing for the homeless. Um, you know, the TIF, TIF, the city generates 660 million of revenue, TIF revenue annually. I think half of that needs to go back to the city for city services. <laughs> the other half can go into TIF for, for investment, but I'd like to drain half the TIF and 10% of that should go for scattered site um, homeless housing around, around the city. Um, and then what we do is we pull in the local, the local community organizations who are uh, whether it's a church or um, there's other nonprofits in the community, and they can help um, oversee that. Okay, great. We're going to move to uh, fair housing in the city, mm -hmm. and this question is for you, Paul. Okay. The west side and south side of Chicago has vacant lots and abandoned property over the past 50 years. In fact, uh, one uh, individual 
described it as a third world country. How would you change those conditions? I may have described it as that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, let me just say this. We, we need to do uh, a number of things. They're telling um, us we got one minute. Okay, we need to okay. do a number of things in affordable housing. First of all, we need to make it more difficult for people to be dr driven out of their house because of delinquencies and foreclosures, period. Mm -hmm. Got to keep people in their house. And there's equity programs where the city comes in, picks up the responsibility, gets, uh, gets equity in the property, and then keeps people in homes. Second thing is we need to stop gentrification by freezing property taxes. Uh, you know, if your property taxes are driving too many people out of their homes. The third thing is we need to take, the city needs to seize all this vacant property, either vacant lots or these unoccupied residential properties and bring them in, turn them over to community-based organizations for ownership. The city will retain an equity share. Take some of this, these development fee monies that the city comes in, that the city's been getting in, to allocate to these developers so they can renovate these buildings and then put these buildings back online not only to create more affordable housing but they can put them online maybe the community needs a domestic shelter maybe the community needs housing for the homeless they need transient housing they need housing for ex-offenders for those previously incarcerated one of the biggest issues for those previously incarcerated is the absence of affordable housing this I call it the Chicago housing uh, the, the Chicago uh, Housing Equity Fund would, in effect, take these prop properties, give the community ownership of these properties, and then the community, work with the community and local developers to, in effect, retrofit those properties so they can address the homeless issues, regardless, uh, the full, uh, it, it, you know, the full comprehensive uh, uh, needs that are needed in the community could be addressed in this manner. Now, they have a similar question, but... On your <laughs> war, at, at, at your Hort level. Yeah, so city-owned land, um, we you know it should we should be building on it. I don't know why we're land banking. We do, there's a great demand for housing, and it should be that we should build 100% affordable on that. Uh, in other areas, uh, tiny homes, right? We need to re reduce, um, loosen up the building code to allow for smaller homes because you can do prehab homes at 50, 60 thousand in other parts, in tiny home village. They tell us to wrap up. Okay, uh, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna split it. Uh, I'm going to give you the time first. Why should we vote for you as mayor, Paul? Go ahead. You well, have it. Well, let me answer that question by answering your first caller's question. Uh, you should vote for me for mayor because I've really laid out a detailed plan on how we're going to revitalize those areas of the city that have been long neglected. You know, when Dr. Martin Luther King made his Lincoln Memorial speech, that speech was about economic opportunity. That speech essentially said that you cannot have real social justice without economic opportunity, without economic justice. So I've talked about taking opportunity zone uh, uh, tax incentives and t taking full advantage of them so we can invest billions in the west side and the south side. I've talked about taking a third of all TIF okay. monies and investing in those areas. So I've, I've identified Thank you, Paul. a, a way Thank to do that. David. Thank you. So I, uh, Why should I have we a, vote for you, Baldwin? I'm the only candidate born and raised in the community. Um, I know it very well. My family's been there 60 years. I have a profound vision for the neighborhood. It, it is an economic development, uh, uh, economic growth and development plan. Uh, no other candidate has that, and it, it is uh, it, it includes br bringing a technology park to Humboldt Park, the first technology park in the city, where we can do uh, we can do solar, wind, energy, sell it back to ComEd, take a revenue stream from that, provide free public Wi-Fi. Uh, we could have after-school programs and bring in an after-school program called STEM, Science, Technology, Thank Engineering, you, David. Arts, Math. Thank you, David. Paul, it was a pleasure <laughs> having you here. David, rapid fire. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for Thank having you. me. Until next time.